Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of the uh, Kernel Recipes 10th edition. It's been an honor to host, to have NetConf hosted at Kernel Recipes. I really appreciate that we've been able to do this. So thanks to the conference organizers for letting me do this. So I imagine as the godfather, I had special powers to make this happen this time. We had two days of content. On the first day, Alexi had started a discussion about NetConf itself and where we should have it. I'm personally very comfortable doing it here at Kernel Recipes if the uh, conference organizers are comfortable with letting me continue to do this. I think they are. Some other suggestions were to co-host it with LPC. The problem with LPC is that two, there's two, two issues, in my opinion. One, it's a little bit too close to net, net dev. And second of all, it's kind of gotten so huge that it's even hard to get tickets. They sell out very quickly. So it'd be a shame that people who want to come aren't able to come. Kona Recipes, on the other hand, is, tends to be scheduled at a different time period and therefore is more conducive to getting people who want to come to be able to come. Alexi also talked about tree management because we have many different subsystems with their own trees and their own processes. And we have, of course, the networking tree. And then the, BP, the BPF guys have their own tree as well. And we integrate their changes periodically. And they have their own testing and verification mechanisms. So coordinating that is, is important. The other issue is, at this point, most of the networking track at LPC is basically BPF content, I would say. I would say the vast majority. That's not a bad thing. I think we've been moving in that direction for a while. And uh, going to a mostly BPF content was like inevitable. It's not to say that the generic networking stack is becoming less important or less relevant. On the contrary, it is the basis by which BPF can evolve in that environment. So if we didn't have a stable networking stack, the BPF wouldn't have anything interesting to interact with and uh, build upon. So we need to keep both going strong. Tokate had some discussions on XDP, past, present, and future. As a, another continually evolving piece of technology. And I'm glad to see that people like him are working so hard and diligently on that to make sure it's in tip top shape and going where it's supposed to go. Jesper gave a discussion on the page pool. The page pool is a buffer management me mechanism. The interesting thing about this is where we could be headed is that instead of socket buffers, SKBs, we could have page pool be the uh, base buffer management facility for networking. That would be great. I think it would be much easier to write drivers if page pool was the uh, common baseline buffer management facility that drivers used. It also means that page pool itself would evolve much faster and be, because it's so much more important that it works well and it's efficient. So I look forward to seeing that work. Alexander talked on GRO overhead. If you don't know, GRO is how we build, take, take small packets coming in and combine them into super packets for reception. And this is an important piece of technology because one of the things that makes that is hard with the networking layer is that we have this transactional cost. Every packet takes a certain number of CPU cycles to process. So if you amortize that by combining a lot of packets into one, then you only you decrease the amount of overhead per packet is great. It means you only have to do the routing lookup once, you only have to demux the socket one time, et cetera, et cetera. So it decreases the transactional cost of networking traffic. Jesper uh, also talked about the case of, say, of software QD. And this is good because Thomas was talking to me also these past few days about how case, case software IRQ is 
a bit of a mess. Unfortunately, all networking packet processing occurs in KSOF RQ context. So if you're trying to get low latency, for example, on a uh, real-time kernel, it's not going to be easy if KSOF RQT is pegged doing network packet processing. So any ways to alleviate that? And we've all, always been putting different hacks and things into KSOF RQ to improve networking performance. So any improvement in that area will be welcomed by the networking folks. Paolo was discussing inclusive language, so we want to get away from the slave master te te terminology in things like bridging and bonding because some people find that offensive for good reason. But what's interesting is that it's not like we can just delete the old stuff because that would break APIs. So we have to do it in a more evolutionary fashion for example, start with adding the new names, trans, getting user space to start using the new names, and then maybe eventually sometime long in the future we can get rid of the old ones, but not right now. He also talked about GRO. That's a popular topic you can see. IP fragmentation, which is a, which is a kind of like indirectly a form of GRO and MPTCP checksums, because MPTCP doesn't just use the normal TCP checksums. It has its subsidiary checksum that sits on top of everything because, it, because of the multiple channels it supports and everything. Jerry discussed DevLink. If you don't know, DevLink is our way to configure devices at the high level. So if you have a networking device that has four physical ports, sometimes you just want to configure the top level device and not the individual ports. And DevLink gives you a way to abstract and represent that. So it's a very powerful part of Linux networking. Florian discussed MDMS rake up and offload, which is very interesting. Vladimir talked about IEEE 8021CB and Ethernet over backplane links. Vladimir does a lot of really good work on our low-level PHY and DSA drivers, so I'm glad that he was able to, to come and make a discussion. Jakob discussed on day two the uh, development process, including our patchwork box, CI, and the Q API. Um, if you don't know, in patchwork, we have a bot that runs every time a, a patch shows up on the mailing list that does basic checks, like all the things that people should be doing before they submit a change. It's great because if I go through my patchwork queue in the morning, I can see that the patchwork bot caught errors that should be corrected by the submitter before I even look at the change. It's great. The, the bot basically checks simple things like, is it well formed? If it's a bug fix, is there a fixes line? Are the tags formed properly? These sorts of things. We also do basic build testing, and uh, this is hard to scale, obviously. Especially the people in the kernel CI world know that this is like having horsepower is important. Someone noticed that the patchwork plot hadn't been w w working for the past week, and that makes it hard to do development work. So the interesting thing is that as we get more tools and more automation in our development process, we become kind of almost addicted to them. Like, we almost can't function when they're not available. So that's how important these tools and analysis is. I think we could get even more deeper into this patchwork bot and CI stuff. To, but it's a lot of work. Someone has to do the work. Even small things like when the patchwork bot doesn't process something properly or misparses something, someone has to fix it. It's not like it's going to fix itself. So it's important to have people working on this. And I really appreciate that Jakob worked on all this. Willem discussed refactoring complex code. This is an interesting topic because, for example, when is it a good time to refactor complex code? Because there are, of course, obvious side effects to this. First of all, someone else could be making new changes in that area while you're doing the refactoring. This means that when they finally get to submit their changes, they're going to have a bunch of conflicts and have to respin re their patches. The other thing is, if you fix a bug in a piece of 
refactored code, the backports become more difficult, not just for the developer, but for everybody. The people who have to maintain the st stable trees, like Greg in the back there, and the various distributions and everyone else who has to do backports. Backporting without conflicts is difficult work. You have to understand the code that's being changed. You have to basically be able to self-evaluate the change in an independently from the original change. He also talked about so devmem, which is direct GPU data placement. This is really interesting because, as you know, ML and AI is like the big thing right now. So anything that makes that more efficient or scale scalable is definitely desired. Florian talked about the workshop, specifically about multi-CPU spreading for its single tunnel acceleration, which sounds really interesting because anytime you can spread the work across multiple CPUs, it's beneficial. IP table support for offload, that should be interesting. Um, PFK deprecation, this is interesting because the original AI API for doing IPsec was PFK, which is like a traditional BSD Unix socket, which takes commands and executes them and gives back a response. It's very similar to Netlink, but different enough that we had to implement it separately. The thing is, it's, it's kind of gotten crufty over the years. There are definitely some problems with it, and it's getting old. The, the thing is, if we, if we want to remove it so we don't have to maintain it anymore, we have to make sure that all the tools are converted over to the Netlink-based IPsec configuration. Most have, that's the good news. The bad news is not all of them have, but eventually someday we will, we will be able to say, everyone uses the new API so we can get rid of PFK. That would be great. Daniel Borgman talked about header data split. This is a really interesting topic because the idea is that the NIC itself can see where the networking headers are and put them into one buffer, and then take the data part and put it into separate buffers. This allows you to page align that, the data part of the packet, and basically then you can flip it into a page that's used by the file system or a user application, and it's like this allows zero copy to actually be realized. The other interesting topic was big TCP and combining it with zero copy because big TCP allows us to represent larger size TCP data packets and zero copy would allow us to do it efficiently. So the, mo the biggest win would be able to combine these two technologies at the same time. He also talked about BPF MPROG, which is really interesting because this is, we're finally getting to the place where we can uh, control the execution of BPF in a way that there are like ordering requirements and interdependencies between BPF programs in a pipeline. This allows you to build bigger, more complex, more interesting uh, applications using BPF because you can, uh, you can say, okay, I have, my, uh, I have my filter for bad IP addresses. I have my uh, load distributor and once you can have those in a pipeline, the, the filtering and then the, the load, load balancing. And then you might want to say, oh, I also want to do some extra statistics on all the packets that arrive in my system. So you could put a program in front of all of that and we, can, we now have a way to facilitate that in a straightforward manner. So you could like, just add custom statistics whenever you want at the beginning. And I think that's a really powerful, way, powerful tool. Eric Dubizet discussed struct file organization. Networking has its own data structures, but it relies on, of course, the Unix file API to get at those sockets. So struct file itself is accessed very frequently in the networking for every, almost every Unix socket interface. You're going to have to touch various parts of the Unix file. So he's trying to do things in a way that the most important read-only things are in one cache line, and the things that get modified a lot are in a separate cache line. This will increase performance significantly. He also discussed not cloning SKBs in the uh, networking tab. This is where all the packets get sucked in for TCP dump and the like. The problem is right now, we stupidly clone the packet, then filter it, 
and then drop. What we should do instead is filter it first, and then if we don't, we don't drop the packet, then we can clone it and send it into the tap. The reason we clone it is because there are, we don't want to modify pieces of data that other elements could be looking at because the packet gets sent to multiple destinations, right? He's also discussing deferred wake-ups because every time we make space available in the socket buffer or something else interesting happens, we wake up somebody, some process. And this can lead to the galloping herd problem, as you may understand. So decreasing the amount of, of wake-ups could improve performance significantly. He's also discussing a, a three-band FQ scheduler with weighted round robin, which Google has been using internally for a long time. I mean, you could rebuild this facility using the existing package scheduler things, but it makes such a huge data structure that it, it doesn't scale well very often, and it eats a lot of memory. So that's the incentive behind this specialized scheduler, and I hope to see that in the future. We also discussed Willie, Willie's idea about UDT, UDP accept. This may sound strange to have accept on a datagram socket, but it actually makes sense if you think about it. A lot of programs that use UDP actually, internally, it's stateful and connected. So usually it's a request response kind of situation. So what you want to do is you want to be able to Clone the socket when you get a new request so that you can manage the connection independently and therefore spread out your work on multiple threads. Have a socket or a group of sockets per thread to distribute the load. And currently that's not easy to do without a lot of hacks and it's not a, it's not a very clean or uh, uh, straightforward procedure to do it now. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to discuss modeling DPUs and IPUs because hardware is like really important these days. And how we interface with that hardware and what it can do is will drive our development in the future quite strongly. David Ahern discussed using Linux TCP for machine learning use cases and supporting big TCP on IPv6. Currently, we, we only support it on IPv4. And we, having IPv6 support, therefore, is important. Zero cost counters for user space monitoring. I think this is a really interesting topic too. Because what you really want to do, you don't want to have a wake up a process every time an event happens. That doesn't scale. Go back to the deferred wake ups conversation. What you want is like a page in memory that user space can pull periodically to see increments and changes to the statistics. That's, that scales a lot better. It's better for mon overall for monitoring. Uh, I hope to see that in the future. Florian also discussed fixing CVs and NF tables. Another topic is technical debt. There are a lot of things in the kernel that we still got to maintain and stay on top of, but their use usefulness has decreased over time to the point where do we really want to invest all those developer resources into this? A good example would be net filter bridging because I remember when I went in a long time, I, I worked on part of that, and it, it creates so many small hacks all over the place because it wants to do routing lookups and you need to have a fake route generated every time it does one of those, and that's just ugly, it's all over the place. Um, technical debt is a reoccurring topic because we only have a fixed amount of human resources to work on these things and to fix bugs and to clean code up. Over time, the kernel accumulates a lot. I think it's something like several hundred patches per day in the networking, and I don't know how we handle it. If you saw my talk last year, you see that delegation is an important element of being able to stay on top of this stuff. I would not, we would not be able to stay on top of the networking changes if it was just me still. I just, I just couldn't do it. So I thank them so much for helping me. It's important. I'd like to thank the Kernel Recipes Kernel organizers. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the hard work you do. Kernel Recipes is one of the few conferences that has stuck to its roots and its basic ideals. 
A lot of other conferences have grown out of their original scope to the point where they're almost completely un unrecognizable these days. To be honest, as someone who's been around for a long time, Kono Recipes is the only conference that feels like the original old school conferences we used to have as Lin when Linux was small and uh, not so prolific. And this is good to see. This is the environment I want to be in when I want to discuss technical issues. So. I really want to thank them for shepherding this and taking such good care of this baby. And I wish you a lot of luck in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to thank specifically Simon and Paolo for taking notes and giving them to me so I could work on these slides. Without them, I would have no idea. And also the rest of the networking development team. Without them, we wouldn't have the most fantastic networking stack on the planet, which I believe it is. And I'm very proud to be the godfather this year and to maintain the Linux networking stack. It's, it's a pleasure. Every day, every day is a pleasure still to work on this technology. I mean, how many other people get to have their pulse on one of the most important pieces of networking infrastructure on the planet every day? It makes me proud every day to work on this. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of Kernel Recipes. <laughs> Any questions? You get to have a live Ask Me Anything. Hey, Dave. Hey there. Uh, how much are we being limited by the <laughs> BSD socket API? Do you ever feel like we should have a completely new user API? For? for? For networking. Should we have a completely different API? This has been discussed in the past, particularly something that would facilitate, facilitate direct data placement better than the socket stuff does, because the socket stuff just operates with buffer pointers and lengths and whatever. Something that kind of abstracted away the, I have this page, please put the next page of TCP data in that page. That would be fantastic. I don't know what it would look like. <laughs> the thing is, I don't know how excited I would be to add new system calls, for example, but like maybe building on top of something we have already, like Netlink, for example, would be more easier to swallow. It's a good question. Um, can you say a little bit more about uh, KSoft IRQ, so what the problems are and what the possible solutions are? The problem is that KSoft IRQ, if there's work to do, it wants to keep working so it loops. The, the most difficult heuristic is when to break out of that loop so that other things can happen. And currently, one thing that happens is if things are overloaded, it just it spawns a kernel thread. So one idea is to make all the soft IRQ processing threaded, that would, that would be an interesting solution. That, that's what Thomas suggested to me, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Because the problem right now as it is, is that we have this unique, this piece of, this small piece of code which is supposed to schedule soft IRQs. If there were threads, we'd let the scheduler do it. The scheduler is much better at distributing load and making those kind of decisions. That's what it's designed for. Uh, it starts a little bit earlier already because you have the local button half disabled, which is basically a pure CPU big kernel lock. Right. And now you have tons of crap in uh, protected or prevented by that, which it's completely independent of networking. It's mm. it's timers, it's talklets, and whatever. So. Um, you have these long pieces of code which disable button halves, but then you can't do actual button half processing with, during that time. Right. So this is this is all we discussed that before. This is in the in the real time tree. This really pops up because we exaggerate these these things and uh, they don't scale ever. And I want to reiterate that you're not going to be able to replicate the logic and power of the full task scheduler in a one function that just deals with soft IRQs. Yeah, but because you, then you can also separate out things better. You can do low 
priority packed processing in one thread and you have your low latency, high priority processing in a different thread. Right, right now you can't do that because you always contend on, 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 the, on the bottom of processing. Right. That would be a lot more powerful. You could even assign RT priorities to right. different software. Yes. Whatever and the application requires. Right now there's like no control. It's just every man for himself. Yeah, and, 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 and then random drivers use software accused tasklets and whatever and do the, do the hell in the callbacks. Right. So it's, it's all not controllable by the scheduler in any way. And resource <laughs> control is, and we learned all of that. I mean, you see it in the networking too. Uh, if you can't do proper resource control, you, you fail. Can't. I'm glad I gave Thomas a platform to discuss this again. Speaking of somebody who, um, about 13 years ago, attempted to do exactly that with an RCU, the, I mean, I tried that. I actually released it, and, and people got really upset with me because if you're an interrupt handler, a hardware interrupt handler, and you say soft IRQ, it does a non-atomic set of bit in a per CPU variable. Uh, when I replaced that with a full wake-up of the scheduler, um, again, people got really upset with me. And so that's why there's no CB and not no CB in... Uh, RCU today. It, I was discussing with Thomas the other day that one thing you have to be careful about is a lot of these soft IRQ handlers don't accept to be, expect to be changing CPUs and that could happen with a threaded soft IRQ. Uh, and that, and that's, that's actually, if you offload, you have that choice in RCU. You can, you can offload to a, a, a no CBK thread, you can let it do what it wants. I mean, if you want to pin it to the CPU. But if you're halfway through a function that's using a per CPU variable in the networking and then you change CPUs, it could corrupt data. And, and, and to your point, in, uh, within RCU, if you're in the middle of doing a callback, you don't get to change CPU either for the same reason. Exactly. But, but, the, but that's, that's the main concern. I mean, certainly if we have something we're running for a long time, it makes sense to let the scheduler control it. But if we're going to do two callbacks, Yes, um, and I think the networking qualifies for that requirement. Yeah, um, so I, I, I agree with everything you say. It's just I got burned <laughs> already. No, but anyway, just by the way, we have this thing called migrate disable. So for like this situation, by the way, I don't, I don't know if you remember in 2008 at the networking and LPC, I presented switching everything over to uh, soft IRQs back then. I don't know if you remember that talk, but just I just want to throw that out. You know, you have NAPI, which I found out what means mm -hmm. new API. If you do this, please call it eNAPI, even newer API. <laughs> Anyone else? I don't know if everyone remembers, we used to call soft IRQs base handlers, BH. Yep. And um, there's an interesting story behind this. <laughs> Way back in the day when Linux was new, we didn't have soft IRQs. And so someone took the concept from BSD and added soft IRQs, and Linux was like, this is disgusting. And someone took that change and just cut and search and replace soft IRQ with base handler. And Linus said, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And so that's the history behind that. He ha Linus hates when I tell that story. <laughs> Ted So, yeah. Um, you, you said uh, you discussed uh, DPUs during, uh, during the workshop. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, uh, Linux support for DPUs from the host side? And often these, these network cards have a full OS uh, on them. Yes. Uh, have you seen any movement in upstream support to run Lin mainline Linux on them? Yes, many device drivers for devices that can support QoS and hardware have the offload feature because we have all the hooks and the paths in the TC layer to propagate QoS configuration changes down to the driver. We can offload that, and we do. Thank you. Anybody else? I knew my talk would be off derailed into a soft IRQ discussion somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's unavoidable. It's in a long time coming. Gotta do something about it. I'm glad people are thinking about it. That's a good thing. All right, there are no other questions. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate everything.